We just got our first eggs. That's so exciting. He has actually been in with his girl. A couple of beautiful pearly whites. Let me know in the comments down below what you think those belong to. On Christmas. Could you imagine? That would have been the best Christmas gift ever. But in today's video, we are going to be going through the preparations that myself and my girlfriend Bree go through for the breeding season. It's not gonna be a entire walkthrough of, you know, setting up the incubator and stuff like that. If you guys want a video like that, make sure you let me know in the comments down below and I will do so for you. But right now, it's just gonna be going through giving you guys an update, what you need, and what you should have before you start breeding. I do wanna thank the sponsor for this video, Exoterra. They sent me out their brand new incubator, which you guys will see later on. Let's get to the video. And you guys already know what we're talking about today, but I just wanted to let you know that for all the things that I talk about, whether it be the smart plugs, the incubator itself, I'll try and leave a link for, all the, the useful things in this video, I will leave affiliate links in the description down below. Click the show more tab and click on the link that you are looking to purchase. It is an Amazon affiliate, so I do make a small commission at no extra cost to you. In addition to those links, I do have merch. Merch is also linked down below for you guys to go check out. Even just watching the video is greatly appreciated. So without more blabbling, let's get into the first point, and that is what you're gonna need to do before the breeding season. There's so many things to consider before you start breeding season and actually putting your animals together. Bree and I have a whole list of things that we hope to breed. We have the Strophorus, the Hognose, the Euromastics, the Chihuahua Geckos. I attempted to try the Turtles. There's a whole list of things that we hope to breed, but there's a lot of things that need to be done before you actually pair the animal. Now let me know in the comments down below what animals you hope to produce this year, 2021. Most notable things that happens before putting the animals together is the seasonal cooling. Not all animals require the cooling itself, but at very least they do require a difference of photo period. So, so I'm here to share with you our recipe and this is our first year doing it. So don't take my word for gospel or anything like that. I'm just sharing with you guys what we're trying this year and maybe at the end of the year, we'll see what babies we have. Now around Canadian Thanksgiving, which is in October, and that is the right time for a Thanksgiving, <laughs> we begin to drop the light and the temperatures. Most notably the photo period. So every week starting around mid-October, we start to knock down the amount of light given per day by half an hour per week. The lights will be on at 8.30, and then they'll stay on until 8.00. The next week they'll turn on at 8.30 and they'll turn off at 7.30. Now this for a lot of animals, especially the non-equatorial animals, will kind of start to tell them, okay, it's time to slow down. The temperatures are dropping, the barometric pressures are changing. It's time for me to chillax a little bit. Especially with the Euros, a lot of people who breed them regularly say that it is a absolute necessity to do that photo period drop. Not necessarily a heat drop, but for this year I did actually drop the heat on the Euromastics by about 10 degrees Fahrenheit throughout the winter period. During this time, you can expect there to be less activity and they just kind of are more lethargic and hiding away. Now, just after American Thanksgiving in November, the temperatures and the time is kind of at its lowest. So we only provide about seven to eight hours of light a day. Their heat spots act accordingly. The temperatures in the room drop at nighttime, especially to the kind of mid 60s to low 60s. Now we're not exactly sure if that's quite low enough for some of the species to go, but we're giving it a try and we're hoping to get them onto that cycle at very least. Typically here in the Toronto area, the lowest temperatures are in the late January, early February type deal. And that is what we saw this year with temperatures reaching as low as minus 30 degrees outside. And uh, they obviously weren't that low in the room, don't worry. <laughs> but Valentine's Day, another kind of easy guide parameter day, we're starting to ramp things back up. Right now it's the beginning of March and we're ramping things up. They're at about eight and a half hours of light a day. The temperatures and the photo period will kind of ramp up until about early to mid June and then they'll be at their full winter temperatures and hopefully some breeding will happen. 
Now during cool temperatures, do actually stop the feeding of the snakes especially, and I really slow down the Euromastics. This is them horking down right when their temperatures started ramping back up. But that pretty much concludes the section of what we do before breeding season actually starts. Now some of you guys might be asking yourself, how do you, with a room that you guys have, go through and change or turn on the lights every single day, a half an hour early, reliably? And simply put, we don't. What we actually employ is the use of smart plugs. The use of the smart plugs, they come in many different shapes, many different sizes. This is one that we use here. We use the brand GoSund. I think there's other brands in the States that you can find, but if you're really not wanting to spend a relatively reasonable amount on these, I believe a pack of two of these two kind of outlet bars is only about 20 or $30. Instead of spending the 20 or $30 on a smart plug like that, which I would highly recommend, we'll get into the reasons why in just a minute, you can also get one of these power bars that has the timers all set into it. So you can set your times when the lights turn on and when the lights turn off, and it's relatively simple to change. The pros of the smart plug heavily outweigh its cons. It's really only con is just the cost of them. But the pros is that you can change them from your phone. You don't need to go crawling under your rack, trying to find your power bar, trying to hold one button while hitting another or anything like that. You can simply just go on your phone, open the app and change the time. It is beautiful. The TLDR is, it just makes life easy. I think there's kind of a stigma in the hobby and just in general that the smart plugs cost a ton of money, but honestly they really don't. They're very reasonable for what you get and they are so useful. The second thing you guys need to consider before breeding season hits and before you guys get eggs is an incubator. Exoterra just sent me their brand new incubator, the Precision Pro model. It actually looks really wicked. Why don't we get it unboxed right now? All right, so we're down here in front of the beautiful Spangler right here. You guys can't even see that, but these are not included with the incubator itself. These are the incubator boxes that Exoterra has released along with this incubator. I will be talking about this more later in the video. Get into this. This is pretty cool. This is a list of all the incubation temperatures for various different species of aquatic turtles, semi-terrestrial turtles, tortoises, lizards, and even snakes. So actually really awesome information on the packaging. And here is the incubator itself. It is very slick. It's a nice black color as you guys can see. And I think something that is probably the most important of this incubator is the module right here. Now this is the dimming pulse proportional thermostat that actually controls the heat in this incubator. In most incubators, it isn't actually a true thermostat that controls the temperature. It's just a simple on off switch. It heats up really hot, goes off. This controls it much more precisely and something that you want to take note of is this little certification under my thumb. This, I believe, is the only certified use incubator in North America. This little thing right here basically covers your butt, the store's butt that sold you the product, and the manufacturers of the product in case of an emergency like a fire or something breaks out. Insurance has got your back if this little guy is on there. If not, which none of the incubators that I've ever seen have that certification. So good job Exoterra for kind of covering everybody's behind and making a very reliable product. Now on the inside here, we got our little foam insert, which under it, you are supposed to fill this basin with water. Why you might ask? And that is because of this nifty little white puck here. This is the brand new Exoterra USB humidifier. Now this comes with the actual incubator itself, but you can also buy it separately. Why might you buy this separately? Well, let me show you. Now, just before I plug this in, I just wanted to show you guys how little water there is in this dish. 
check it. It's like five millimeters at most. And here's the craziest part. You plug it in and it simply works. Like it just works, that's all. Plug it in and immediately it recognizes that it's in water and just starts cranking out the fog. How cool is that? I think this has some huge applications in naturalistic vivariums or paludariums, whatever. This is something that I would highly recommend you guys purchase. If you don't need an incubator, at very least, try this thing out. So now that you've seen how it actually works, essentially what you're going to do, fill the basin with water and then let this little guy float on top. It goes through the top of the hood, then it goes to the USB port on the back here, or you can power it with any USB brick that you're looking for. This is just hooked up to an actual humidity gauge and a hygrostat. It's actually gonna control the humidity in the incubator itself. That thing looks pretty sweet. Hey, I, I'm really excited to try it out. It looks slick, it is controlled by the thermostat, and I think it's gonna produce some really awesome results, so. I'll get back to you guys with a more comprehensive kind of review at the end of the breeding season if we have, hopefully we have some eggs that will use it. I'll make another video for you guys if you're interested. Something that not too many people think of when they're preparing for breeding season is where to put their eggs. And Exoterra has released their brand new incubator box. And these guys are pretty basic. They're just a standard 12 egg incubator tray. Uh, it allows for the suspension method. You can put water in the bottom, you can put vermiculite, you can put whatever medium you want to put in the bottom, and it will basically keep the eggs from sitting in the water or in the medium itself. Now there is only one thing that I can see that I would like to see in a new iteration of the incubator box, is the inclusion of a port or something to allow for a digital thermometer to be inserted into the actual bin itself. This one does come with a little thermometer. It works, but I would like the more precise measurements of their actual digital thermometers rather than a glass tube. Now that we've covered the incubator and the incubator box, let's talk about some incubation mediums. The two most commonly used incubation mediums are perlite and vermiculite. These can basically both be classified as volcanic popcorn because when they're heated to about 1600 degrees Fahrenheit, they actually pop and form the airy like structure that you see here. Perlite's natural state is actually volcanic glass, but when it's superheated, it turns into popcorn and expands into the great pearly substance that you see here. Now vermiculite is essentially the mica. If you aren't a geology nerd, then you probably don't know what that is, but here's a photo for you. It's essentially the mica counterpart of its other volcanic cousin, perlite. My thoughts on perlite and vermiculite are relatively limited. I've really only used vermiculite when incubating eggs and Brie has the pretty much same experience as I do. We've just pretty much only used vermiculite over the perlite because we have lots of plants and perlite is useful for those. If you guys have any suggestions of other things that you would strongly recommend having, definitely let me know in the comments down below. I'm curious to hear what you guys have to say. And let's move on to an update of what we're trying to breed and how things are going right now. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm filming this in the beginning parts of March, so things are starting to come out of their cool season, and uh, this is what we've got going on. So Lux is actually out. Now this is Bree's male albino hognose. He's a cool guy. He has actually been in with his girl, and in the tank right next to Lux, we have Rowan, Lux's breeding mate, partner, I don't know. <laughs> she is a conda hog nose. She looks like they actually did lock up a couple times and uh, there might be eggs coming from her relatively soon. We're not entirely sure on when they're expected to lay. We're basically just waiting for another kind of crappy, snowy and or rainy day and we will throw them back together and see if we can get a confirmed lock on them. But moving up from the ground, I don't think you guys have actually seen this tank yet. These are Breeze Chihuahuas. These are Pine Isle Chihuahuas. Minaru Geku Chihua. That is her female. She should be laying pretty soon here. 
Brie is checking pretty much daily for eggs just so we know what cycle she's actually on because uh, this will be a first time breeder for us this year. And we're really hoping for some successful babies. Some very nice P.I. Chihuahuas. Come on, sweetie. She's super pastel -y. Really nice color. She's obviously not fired up right now, but she is looking great. And Groot, the male, is somewhere in the back cork bark hollow. Moving on to the next project. She, <laughs> she is up here sunning herself. Uh, these are the Strophorus ciliaris, the northern spiny tail gecko. That is the female <laughs> right there. Absolutely zonked out, full of both crickets, and I believe right in the center of your screen, those are eggs. I'm really hoping she is very chunky, and she spent the last few days digging up her lay bin, so we're really, really hoping that that cool down, and now that the temperatures are starting to get a bit hotter, that she starts going. Fingers crossed for them. Really hoping that we are able to get some eggs and successfully produce them. That would be our first time doing that. And then over here, we have Bree's trio of Eurodactylodes viardi, which are an incredible species of gecko. Really friendly, really chill for the most part. These guys are decent with handling, but we don't really handle them all that much. Uh, these guys definitely slowed down a ton during winter time. Normally, we feed them a little cap of food that you can see down there. And in summertime, that gets cleared out in less than a day. But during winter, they would leave the majority of it sitting and it would actually dry out by the time they ate it all. These guys are definitely starting to pick back up. They're starting to eat a bit more. And you guys saw at the beginning of the video, there was some eggs, and actually that was from the Eurodactylodes viardi. Hopefully you guys didn't skip until this far into the video to see this and make your guess now. But that is where these guys were from, so if you guessed that, congratulations. I'll give you a high five when, if I ever see you. That's, that's your reward, okay? <laughs> but we do have our first eggs from the VRD, so that is very, very exciting. First eggs of the season. You know, it's always a good thing when you actually have something. I guess they're not in the incubator because they don't really need to be in the incubator, but let's move on to the last breeding project of this year and uh, update you on them. The Niger Euromastix, Hugo, and Olga is can see her leg and her belly flab right there but they are in here doing well unfortunately i actually got an infertile clutch of eggs from them on christmas could you imagine that would have been the best christmas gift ever but instead i got a clutch of 10 duds from you missy why why you gotta do that to me huh that's so rude look at you questioning what I'm doing. <laughs> These guys are said to react very well to the photo period drop, so I'm hoping that is the case. They've always been kind of weird producers. Like I always get eggs in either like early January or February, so a bit of a strange schedule for them, but these guys are wild caught, uh, long-term captives, I guess at this point, but um, I'm just hoping that I can get them kind of on the right schedule and ready for next year. I don't think there's really much hope for this year because they are pretty much a single clutch animal per year. So uh, I, I don't want to stress her out too much and have them produce two clutches because I don't even know if that's ever been done with Euromastics. So these guys are going to finish launching. A little bit unfortunate news with them. But I'm hoping that the cooldown and the photo period adjustment will help them for next year and uh, get them on the right path for producing some beautiful Euromastix babies next year, 2022 probably. 
And there we have it, you guys. That's how we are tackling this breeding season. We have dropped the temperatures, we have started pairing, and there are even some eggs, as you guys have heard. I hope you guys have learned something from this video. I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. If you want to see more stuff like this, let me know in the comments down below. I do enjoy filming kind of just updates and our plans, because I think that maybe you guys can take something from it and learn from it. I wanna thank Exoterra for sponsoring this video. You guys are the best. Support me, the channel, and the reptile hobby as a whole, so thank you very much. And uh, if you guys liked the video, make sure you click like, make sure you comment down below all the things that I told you to do, do that. Make sure you click subscribe while you're down there and play Ding Dong Ditch with the doorbell next to it. That way you get notified every time I post a video. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll catch you in the next one. New additions. Woo!